Hi there. Um, welcome to um, this fourth in the Edigree Global Education Series. I'm really excited to be here today in the in the new year. Um, welcome to you, and I'm wishing everyone out there um, the happiest of New Years. Today's topic is really exciting. We're going to be um, having a discussion around um, expansion of opportunities for international students who are um, aspiring to attend US universities. And we're going to have that discussion around two particular topics um, or two particular um, points of focus. Uh, one is around English language programs and another is around community college programs. Um, before we jump into that, I um, want to introduce uh, myself. I'm Marlo Johnson. I'm the CEO of Edigree. Um, we're um, very fortunate today to have um, two experts who will be joining us um, to speak about um, their respective areas of expertise. Um, and um, so Edigree itself, to introduce um, Edigree, it's a um, subsidiary of the Educational Testing Service. Our mission, which I invite um, all participants here to explore further, is really to provide opportunities for um, international students. Um, looking at their long-term success, um, providing information and um, connection to universities um, who are partners of Edigree. Um, but um, I would like to go ahead and launch into our discussion for today. Um, and um, in doing that, let me see if I can navigate uh, over here to our, our two speakers. Um, I'm going to ask both of you, if you wouldn't mind, to introduce yourself to yourselves to the audience, and maybe we'll start with you, Robin. Sure, hello everyone. My name is Robin Lilienthal, and I am the provost of a college in the center of Iowa here in the United States called Marshalltown Community College. Um, and we are a college that is, um, has actually two colleges. We have a, a part of the Iowa Valley Community College District. So we have Marshalltown Community College and our sister college, Ellsworth Community College. So greetings from the middle of the United States. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Susan Edgington, and I'm uh, with Arizona State University, uh, and I'm the executive director of Global Launch. Global Launch is the English language program at Arizona State University. And a little about our university, uh, we are about 130,000 students at Arizona State University of which about 10% of those students are international students. And we are located here in beautiful, sunny Phoenix, Arizona. So it's wonderful to see you all. Thanks to both of you and thanks for attending today. Also, thanks to our audience um, for joining. Um, I'm switching over to our agenda slide. Um, and um, before we launch into the actual discussion, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first of all, for attendees, if you have any questions, we would like to be able to respond to them live. And Laura Poggi is kind of manning the, uh, the or personing the, uh, the um, platform to be able to um, field your questions. And um, also, um, there will be at the end of the, um, of the webinar a survey that we would ask that you fill out to give any feedback about um, ideas that you thought were particularly helpful, questions that you may still have. Um, we would be happy to respond to those. Um, there is also a, um, a package, um, some handouts that the, um, that the speakers today have provided. Um, that will give you even deeper information than we may be able to cover in our in our brief time together today. Um, so um, I want to kick off with a um, a kind of broader discussion around what ELP or English language programs are and what community colleges are. Then we're going to dive into some of the benefits and opportunities. We received a lot of questions in advance of this webinar, and we've tried to organize those into some um, points that the speakers can respond to um, formally, and then and then we'll be able to get further questions and answers um, towards the end of the um, of the session today. 
So I'm going to switch off. I don't see anyone right now because I'm I have the slide up on my um, on my computer. So I'm going to switch off the um, the sharing of my screen. So you won't see the PowerPoint any longer, but we won't really need to refer to that throughout. So I hope now that everyone can still see people. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm I'm prone to breaking things when I touch technology. So. Uh, so let's let's jump into um, into the topic for today. Um, we'll begin with you, Susan. Um, mm -hmm. So and and with an acronym, ELP, um, English Language mm -hmm. Program. If you would be so kind, perhaps you can give um, folks out there a, an understanding of what ELPs are and how they may fit into the broader um, higher education structure. Um, mm -hmm. And with particular emphasis, maybe you can talk about um, what it means at ASU and within Global Launch. Absolutely. Happy to. Thank you, Marlo. So an ELP or an English language program, another name you might have heard is an IEP, an intensive English program. Or you may have heard of a program called a Pathways program. Um, all of these are different kinds of programs that a, a U.S. college or university might offer to international students as a type of pathway, uh, a way into the university that helps to prepare international students and give them access to uh, higher education in the U.S. So uh, an ELP, an English language program, is going to be focused on developing English language skills and study skills to prepare international students to be successful at a university. Um, if, if a student does not meet the entry requirement for the university as it relates to English language, this program can be an opportunity to build those skills and fulfill that requirement at the university in order to go on and do uh, your degree study in English. Um, then a pathways program is another opportunity where a student can do both English language study and first year degree study at the same time. And this is an opportunity for a student to build their confidence and learn what it means to be a student in a U.S. college or university. Um, and not every college and university in the U.S. has an English language program or a pathways program. Uh, so as you're researching universities, if this is the type of program that you're interested in, it's one of the things to look at at the university that, uh, that you're reviewing. At Arizona State University, we have both of these programs, and we offer an English language program for students interested in undergraduate degrees or students interested in graduate degree programs. Students might study for eight weeks, or they might study for one year. It really depends on the student's starting English language level. Uh, with a Pathways program, students study for one semester, two semesters, or three semesters, depending on their goals in that program. Uh, and so, you know, these programs are a great opportunity for international students to build their skills before they jump into a full degree program at their U.S. university. Thank you for that overview, Susan. And we'll, we'll dive Absolutely. into some of those opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. in um, Robin, I wonder if you might do a, a kind of similar um, high level introduction um, to um, community colleges in general, um, and you can dive into your, your, your program and network specifically, but just what are community colleges? How do they fit into um, the U.S. higher education system? Um, and um, what kinds of students would avail themselves of them, et cetera? So. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just give sort of a higher level overview of the U.S. higher education system, but in a very simple way. Um, and I, I guess the best way to describe the U.S. higher education system is it's as diverse as the United States is itself. We have all kinds of colleges, universities, community colleges, 
uh, various sizes um, that are available. So you have the large universities, uh, like Susan was talking about with Arizona mm -hmm. State University. Um, you have small private colleges in the U.S. that might be um, run by a, a private board or um, a, have a historical religious affiliation or you know various uh, mission-driven uh, program that way. And then also in the United States is a system of of colleges called community colleges. And there are over 1,100 different community colleges in the United States. Um, some of them are very large, uh, nearly as large as Susan was talking about with Arizona State University with having you know, tens of thousands to maybe even pushing 100,000 students at them. And some of them are quite small, like Marshalltown Community College, where our college has 2,000 students. So anyone can find um, a community college that might fit their best, um, their best interests. Community colleges offer a range of credentials and degrees. Um, the highest degree that a community college will offer is a bachelor's degree. However, that is still quite rare in the United States, so most community colleges offer associate's degrees. And those associate's degrees can take students in two paths generally. One is an associate of arts or an associate of science, and that will lead students to transfer to a college or university, and that is considered equal to the first two years of a bachelor's degree. So you take your community college education and you transfer on, and then you would have potentially two more years um, after you would transfer. There are shorter term um, uh, credentials that students can get as well. Those are typically related to more career driven programs, the kind of training someone might like to get um, to be ready for a skill. Um, nursing is a good example of a career driven um, program that a student could get at a community college. But there's a a wide range of them, uh, engineering tech to um, welding to construction to a whole culinary. There's there's just so many career driven, and those can be offered in a diploma program, which is one year, or an associate's degree program, which is two years. Um, the other unique thing about community colleges specifically is that um, they are open access. Um, institutions. And what that generally means is that our admission standards are those in which we give opportunity to all. We take students where they are um, in their educational journey and help them get there. And so, for example, um, at Marshalltown Community College, we only require a high school diploma or equivalency to be admitted. And then we take that student. If the student needs some help with um, math or reading or some of those kinds of uh, uh, skills, they're able to get those get that training as well as um, English language. And that is both for our international students that we have at the college, but also we often will have domestic students who also are um, their first language at home is not English. And so we, we support that. Um, now, that's not to say that a community college is for somebody who is a lower educational achiever. Um, we have lots of students who are very, very um, skilled. They might be the top of their cl um, graduating class, um, but prefer a community college because our tuition and fee expenses are significantly lower um, than those with other um, institutions. So those are a few quick facts. I'll pause there and uh, we can answer more questions. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, that was a great overview. Um, and um, turning back to our to our theme really for today about opportunities um, for international students. Um, so both of you have alluded to those opportunities in, in your response. Um, previous webinars that we've um, gone through, we've been talking about visa requirements, um, you know, how, how, how challenging it might be to go through a complicated process. But I think in many cases, um, international students will, will face a, a kind of ambitious goal. Um, they're, they're coming out of uh, high schools. They've been working really hard 
um, they're they're looking at um, at a kind of um, end of the rainbow goal about where they want to get with their career. Um, and one of the themes that I think I see emerging here is that um, both of the programs that you're representing can all can be seen in some ways as stepping stones to achieve those those longer term goals. So I wonder if you can um, speak briefly to um, what what expansion of opportunities um, students may experience by virtue of entry into your, maybe we can speak specifically about cases, um, your own program. So, so maybe coming into Global Launch ELP, Susan, mm -hmm. um, what opportunities do students have uh, um, leaving the program um, okay. that they may not have had um, when they entered it, um, and, mm -hmm. and had they gone a direct route to, let's say, undergraduate or graduate school, how might they have been constrained had they not come in, through the Global Launch Program? And, and it'll be the same question to you, Robin. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Thanks, Marlo. So there are really two types of students who are interested in an English language program. Uh, one is a student who wants to develop their English language skills to go on for degree study. They've already decided, I want to do uh, an undergraduate or graduate degree in the United States. The other student is a student who might not be sure if doing degree study in the United States is the right thing for them. So they use an English language program as a type of study abroad experience. And they might come for one term to understand and, and get a feel for a US university environment to, to help them make their final decision about whether or not they want to do a full degree in the US. So it's great, it's a great opportunity for those students who are still exploring um, because it helps them to, to really get a feel for what it means to be a student at a US university to help make that decision. Once a student has decided and they're committed to degree study in the US, um, an English language program is, is helping students to do, of course, it's helping students to learn English, you know, reading and writing and listening and speaking and building, you know, solid English language skills. But it is so much more than just language skills. Um, you know, students are, are learning about critical thinking. How do I read and do research and take the information that I'm that I'm reading in English? And how do I form my own ideas and opinions in English about these topics? And then how do I speak about this or write about this? This is a really important skill in a US university or college and every student needs to spend time uh, polishing this skill. Um, students also, learn how do I interact with a professor in a US university? This may be different than in your home country. So understanding if your professor says, if you need help, contact me, you might be thinking, what does she mean? Does she mean I should call her? I should stop by her office? So we, we help teach you the ways in which it's appropriate in a US university to interact with your professor, how to write an email, how to, how to have this conversation. We teach you how to interact with your classmates. Uh, US university environments are very collaborative. Students do group projects, there's lots of class discussion. And so if you come from an educational environment where that was not common, an English language program gives you experience building those skills. And I think last and maybe to me most importantly, students are learning confidence. You're becoming confident in your language skills, but you're also becoming confident in your academic ability at the university level. So what we see, the opportunity here, is that as students graduate from our program and begin their degree study, there are two really important things that we have found in our research. One is that students who completed our program and start their undergraduate degree in their first semester, they get a higher GPA than international students who have come directly from their home country and not been in an English language program. So academically, 
students are ready to engage and do their coursework. The second thing that we found in our research is that students who have been in an English language program take more classes in their first semester as a degree student. And what this tells us is that students have confidence. They believe, I can do this. I can take these classes and be successful. So that's a huge opportunity if you're coming from outside the US and you're going to spend two years or four years in the US studying, you will start your study prepared, ready to go, knowing what you're capable of and, and successful in your degree study. And we think that that's really important as students you know, build their, their grade point average and they work towards their degree. Um, and it's just a wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Susan. With with your indulgence, and Robin, I, I want to probe probe on uh, this a little just a little bit more, and then I'll, I'll switch over to you. There, you you spoke that as a, as a true educator, um, Susan, mm -hmm. uh, and underscored the immense value in terms of learning. Um, mm -hmm. I, I suspect that um, some of the students out there are also wondering about how this may enhance their opportunities with regard to um, access. Um, mm -hmm. to further institutions and further study. So mm -hmm. um, students build up over a long period of time credentials um, mm -hmm. that are important um, and are kind of um, evidence of their mm -hmm. proficiency. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent might um, certification or completion mm -hmm. from an ELP program be offered up as evidence to mm -hmm. an undergraduate or a graduate program that a student should be admitted, whereas before mm -hmm. then maybe they wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when students complete each level of a, our English language program, they receive a certificate that, that demonstrates uh, the, the level of English that they've attained. So a student who's completed our highest level and is prepared for uh, study at a US university, at Arizona State University, that certificate is enough to fulfill your English language requirement to begin study at the university. So you don't need to complete our program and take a test, such as a TOEFL test or an IELTS test. Completion of our program fulfills that requirement. When you're looking to go from an English language program at one university to a degree program at another university, you have that certificate and it does demonstrate that you have a certain level of English language ability, but I think most other institutions may require that, uh, that proficiency test. But the good news is that instead of spending six months sitting and just studying to take a TOEFL test or an IELTS test, the student has spent six months building their English language skills and building their confidence. So students have, have a, are much more likely to be successful on those tests should they need to take them for admissions to another institution because they've done the hard work. They've done the work to build the skills. So, um, you know, but within the institution, within ASU, that, uh, that certificate is like gold to a student because it means you don't have to take that standardized test. Uh, one other uh, aspect that I'll talk about is with the Pathways program. So as I said, in a Pathways program, you're doing English language and you're doing uh, academic coursework at the same time. So if a student uh, completes the Pathways program at ASU, you have earned 24 academic credits. And those are credits that you can use towards your degree at ASU, or you can transfer those credits to any other US university. Uh, we have very carefully selected the courses that are in, um, in our Pathways program to make sure that these are the types of credits that are transferable to other universities. So you're not taking some strange, obscure class that only ASU recognizes, these are classes that are foundational classes that you would expect to take at any US university. So through that program, you're starting to build your grade point average. And when it, 
if and when you're looking at another university for admissions for your degree program, that credit that you've earned and that grade point average that you've earned is part of the admissions decision at another university. So they look at the work that you did and how you performed. And if you performed well, which we hope you did, that is, that is helping to give you access to other universities because you have one more way in which you've demonstrated what you're capable of as a student. Thank you. Thank you for that addition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Robin, so that, that's become a multifaceted question, but I think you captured all of it. So I'll, I'll hand off to you with that same theme of the stepping stone and opportunities that students experience um, as a consequence of um, going through your program. I think that um, in addition to um, very, very similar to what Susan said um, related to the academic benefits, um, which she articulated very well, I think by entering um, a community college right away when um, they enter the United States, they are beginning to uh, work towards their degree immediately. Um, and that's a benefit, I think, that uh, that, that the community colleges offer because we customize the student experience to where they are at. So we do ask students to take um, the exam, but we don't necessarily care what your scores are for admissions. We use the scores to help in customizing your educational experience. What types of courses are best for you? What English language courses do you need? Or are you proficient enough that, um, that you can um, start right into some of our general courses um, that are uh, more um, traditional first and second year um, transfer courses? The other thing um, that I think is a great advantage is that all of our faculty have the same credentials as any other college or university faculty across the country. They all um, have master's degrees or doctorate degrees in their field of study. Uh, we are credited accredited by the same accrediting bodies that accredit um, all the other colleges and universities. And, uh, and so that really provides a basis for seamless transfer. Our courses transfer, it, for example, in Iowa, all community college associate degree courses and programs transfer equivalent to the first two years at our public universities in Iowa, which means that students do not waste a single credit um, in pursuing their bachelor's degree. Um, our experience here at Marshalltown Community College is that our international students will not only go to um, colleges in Iowa, but they will go across the country to various various colleges, to California or Florida or Illinois or or New York or you know any place in the U.S. And there continues to be seamless transfer from their credits at the community college to whatever receiving institution they are looking for. Part of the benefit of that is that we help our students start to identify where they might want to transfer to and thinking about what kinds of programs they're interested in um, in actually completing their bachelor's degrees in. And so then we can customize their first two years experience to make sure that no credit is um, is. Uh, wasted, I think is the best way to do that. All the while that for those students that are needing to learn English, they're able to take courses for credit that count in their degree um, for English language acquisition and write both speaking and writing. In addition to all of the other uh, cultural and interactive experiences that coming to a college like Marshalltown Community College, a student might have. I met a student um, yesterday from Japan who has very little English skills, um, but he has a, a, a new friend who is also from Japan, who's serving as his mentor um, within that experience because we try to match students up. We have student ambassadors from across the, across the globe who are here to assist students and really provide the advantage of a personalized and customized education 
with the no, the knowledge that those um, that investment in those uh, in, while they're here in their education absolutely um, serves as the as the great foundation for completing whatever their uh, degrees might be. Excellent. So I'll, I'll do a, a high level summary back um, of those answers before diving into the next question. So and correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, but um, I would suggest to the audience that in the case the cases of both ELP and community college um, opportunities, students have in some ways a lower barrier to entry. Um, however, um, that lower barrier to entry does not imply that any compromises have been made in terms of access to excellence in instruction. Um, and even beyond that, um, in both cases, you've described programs that have been custom fit to the needs of international students and are adaptive and responsive to their needs in ways that may not be available um, to a more generic, let's say, undergraduate or graduate program. So um, students, therefore, have an opportunity to go into a program that may be lower barrier to entry, um, a way to learn the skills that they really need to master in going into other programs. I, I understand, Robin, that many of the um, international students who go to community college do go on to other universities and, and tend to transfer after a couple of years and getting that kind of first experience. So this is a, uh, a way in to the theme of our, of our webinar today. It's, it's a way into the kind of mainstream experience that students have been imagining um but it's um it's a path that may lead them to further opportunities is that a is that a good representation <laughs> absolutely oh, yeah. i see not excellent um so we find ourselves in a um, somewhat unique circumstance um internationally now um with the pandemic um still raging um, and that is of course um of great concern to international students um um, seeking places abroad, travel is very limited, access to visas um, is very limited now, even access to appointments to try to get visas um, is very limited right now globally. So um, in, in the cases of your particular programs, um, next question, I'll, I'll reverse the order, I'll let you go first this time, Robin, uh, but um, what about online opportunities? How do those integrate with the on-campus experience? Um, is there an opportunity for a student to begin online, transition to on campus? Um, so how, how do you support an online experience so that a student who might not be able to travel now would still be able to engage um, at Marshalltown? Sure, um, and I'll give an example at Marshalltown that, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, we had our international students, two things happened. They scurried home or they hunkered in place. Um, is basically what happened with our students. And in both cases, um, <clears throat> our institution moved to an online format for the spring semester. Then this year, we did more of a hybrid online or in-person opportunities. Um, by the nature of the visa that comes in, international students typically are limited if they come to the U.S., actually travel here, they're limited in the number of credits that they can take in, in an online experience. Um, and so our, um, our advisors help them to manage that. But with the pandemic, we had um, some students who went home to Pr Brazil in this case and definitely are planning to attend because they um, also are members of our soccer team, which will be um, uh, having its season later this spring um, and they were unable to get home because of travel restrictions um, and things like that and so we were able to continue their education through a hundred percent online experience um, and a lot of times that online is not just 
uh, take it over the computer and read, but much of the online experience is also through uh, teleconferencing or video conferencing, whether the instructor um, would videotape the the course that was happening at the time um, we had last spring we had students who were uh, even further away over in Asia and they were getting up at three o'clock in the morning to live stream their courses once they got home however um, we we made quick made quickly made arrangements so that they could have those videotaped and they could participate um, that way so really trying to help those students be successful when they can't be here on on campus uh, is is really important for us and and provides that opportunity but we have lots of great high quality online courses thanks and then same, same to you Susan about um, kind of online opportunities out of global launch and the ELP in, in particular absolutely so Arizona State University as a university has a long history in online education and actually offers hundreds and hundreds of online, fully online degree programs. So our English language program, Global Launch, started developing online English language learning about five years ago. Um, and we did that because we saw the direction of, of how education is moving and that students want to have the opportunity for access to online education. And language learning online um, is, is different. It's a different type of skill to learn online than other subject areas because of the nature of the four skills that you're developing and the need for live speaking opportunity in order to develop speaking skills. So five years ago, we started developing online language courses. So when, uh, when COVID hit in March, we were very fortunate to have a fully online program ready to go for international students. Uh, because as Robin was saying, students getting up in the middle of the night for a live class online is good for a day or two, but that is not good for an entire program. That's not sustainable for students. So we uh, at Global Launch have what we call an online immersion program where students are doing about 10 hours per week of uh, independent study online, watching videos, uh, watching lectures, doing assignments, doing quizzes, writing papers. And then there's an additional 10 hours per week of live streamed classes where students are interacting with their teacher and with their classmates and they're practicing their skills real time. Those classes are scheduled, uh, geo-scheduled at times that are appropriate to meet audiences in Asia or audiences in the Middle East, uh, because we, we know that uh, the situation with COVID is lasting. So we wanted to be sure that there were opportunities for students that didn't have them up in the middle of the night uh, to access those. And the great thing about our online immersion program is that if you don't have your visa and you can't travel, but you don't wanna to wait to start your program, you can start immediately from your home country. And then as soon as conditions improve and you can travel and you have your visa, you can seamlessly transfer into the campus-based program. And so we've made that work perfectly for students because we know that there's so much uncertainty that you don't need uncertainty in your educational program and so you can be confident that the work that you begin online will transfer directly into the in-person program on campus um, thank you and uh, so uh, kind of other side of the of the same coin in, in some ways so with regard to access and visas and actual travel when that comes available uh, mm -hmm. so in, in the U.S. right now, we're, we're celebrating an uh, inauguration as of yesterday that, that may imply um, some changes in, in, um, in access down the road. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's some optimism that there will be um, a, a loosening uh, of some of the, of the travel restrictions that have been in place. But COVID is certainly still in place and um, visa requirements are certainly um, still quite robust. Um, so, 
with regard to travel, when if when and if a student does want to come on campus, I'm wondering about the support available um, from Marshalltown or from Global Launch um, ELP um, for students to be able to obtain a visa. Um, so I, I know that one of the requirements in looking at a visa is what are the kind of longer term plans in terms of returning in country. Um, so is the process the same, I guess I could ask, as it might be if a student were, were applying to a four-year um, university and what kinds of support are available for applicants with regard to that, that journey? Um, start with you, Susan. Sure, absolutely. So we have a, a student services team that works with students uh, as soon as they're admitted to our program to help them understand what the steps are they need to take in order to get their visa. Uh, and so uh, students receive their visa documents and are able uh, to, to go to a, a US embassy for a visa appointment, the same as a student would if they had visa documents from a four-year university. So they apply for their visa and they come to the US. And as soon as they complete our program, they can then transfer from our program either to ASU or to another university using those same visa documents. And so uh, in our experience, students don't encounter any, any, any unique difficulties getting a visa simply because they're coming for an English language program. It is a, a, an, an understood educational program that international students are, are um, attending. And so visa officers, you know, don't, don't distinguish between whether a student is going to an English language program or a four-year degree program or a PhD program. Uh, it's, it's all higher, a part of higher education in the US. Robin, same question. Sure, and I think uh, the the easiest way to sum it up is, uh, as Susan was alluding to, the visa process is the same no matter what kind of higher education access that you're looking for. Um, at Marshalltown Community College, one of the things that we find important is to help those students as much as we can through the process. And so there are steps in the beginning in order for us to issue the I-20 that's necessary to get the appointment at the US embassy and so working with the students remotely so that they can complete all of those steps in order for us to be able to uh, to get that first step processed the second thing is to have a conversation with the student about what they might be experiencing with their interview for a visa that can be an intimidating experience for anyone mm -hmm. Um, and so it's nice to be able to think through the types of questions that they might be asked and to be able to practice those, um, those answers to those questions. I think what's really um, also important in this whole concept with travel is that we recognize that students are coming from a very long way away. They're leaving their friends and their families. There's an adjustment to that. Sometimes travel is very difficult. We just had two students from New Zealand who um, came to MCC for the spring semester. And so that was a two day trip for these 18 year old young women to make. They didn't know each other before they uh, started traveling, but they certainly got to know each other because they were on the same the same flights and so trying to assure students and their families that uh, we will be assisting them to the best of our ability once a student comes to uh, lands at the airport we are there to pick them up uh, greet them welcome them sometimes for international students they are able to only check one suitcase or maybe two suitcases it's difficult to bring a lot of things with them and so assisting them with that early entry to come to come to campus is very important to us. It's nice also that um, families know that we have housing available to students when they land on the ground and that their students are going to be greeted with a nice room to live in, a, a bed to sleep in, meals to eat. All of those kinds of things are taken care of. So it's not just the visa process that is complicated and COVID times are making some 
some of the travel more difficult. I use the example of our Brazilian students. That's a country in which you have to spend two weeks someplace else in the world that we will accept you to fly into before. So not only are those students going to be leaving Brazil, but but I think they're I think the plans that I heard is that they're going to spend two weeks in Mexico and then fly into the United States. So it is a very um, it can be a very exhausting travel schedule uh, during these pandemic times. Typical times, you know, you're you're able to make your connections and 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 move on, but uh, but during these times, uh, it, it makes it interesting. So I'll I'll play off of that, Robin. So I'll ask this first of you, but I think you're going to have um, a, a response here as well, Susan. Um, I know you will. Um, so in providing, I don't know, comfort and reassurance to to students and their parents and their support network. Um, these are very charged times um, in the in the U.S. and the the last four years have have been challenging um, with regard to not only COVID but also socio political tension. Um, and I mean, as as you look at the news now in the U.S., it it can seem just you know the streets are on fire with unrest and insurrection. <laughs> That's been the the news of the past you know, a couple of weeks anyway. Um, and, and I know that parents and, and students would want to know that they have strong support, um, would want to know that they're coming into a safe environment. Um, I mean, from, from my own experience, that's certainly the case across U.S. universities in particular, which um, are, are very culturally open and inviting and in fact depend upon um, cross-cultural exchange. Um, but I wonder how challenging it's been for you, Robin, to get the message out about that kinds of kind of support, how that support has been necessarily different, um, and how it's changing um, in the context of those challenges, um, and what you're hearing back from students, from families, um, in their experience, and, and how do they actually feel when they get to campus? Uh, it's interesting that you ask that because, of course, we are heightened to the concerns that have been happening in the United States across the, the last several years. But support and safety is the fabric of our campus, regardless of what might be happening any anywhere else. Uh, we're lucky because Iowa, for the most part, is a very... Um, calm state. Um, our, our community is a small city in Iowa where it's a but it's a very diverse city. Um, and so we are we already uh, focus on cross-cultural interactions. We already focus on the importance of understanding people from the point of view that they have, no matter whether it differs from you or not. We create that system and that culture here on campus to um, to to enhance learning and understanding, and not to create div div divisiveness. Sorry about that. Divisiveness or or unrest. One of the things that is important to us, and why we are it's so critical here at Marshalltown Community College to have a robust international program as we do, is that. Many of our students do not have the, many of our native Iowa students who attend MCC do not have the economic means to travel internationally. They're not in a position to be able to have an experience where they could go to an international university. And so we believe it's critical to create that opportunity for them to have the um, interactions and exposures because no matter what field that they go into, no matter what career that they have, it is a global career career and understanding and having interactions and developing deep and, and great friendships and, and relationships with people really helps to enhance the, the um, educational experience all the way all the way around and I do think it's important for students who are considering um, an international experience to really look at the um, sort of demographic makeup of the institution to make sure that that matches 
for them with what their hopes are. Um, you know, it, it can be lonely if they were to go to a place that maybe didn't have as many international students, maybe wasn't quite as prepared to provide the accommodations and the support necessary. But in terms of safety, we focus on it all the time and, and really, really want to make sure. And that's why providing housing, food service, and those support services is critical to really rounding out the high quality educational experience that the student will get. Susan? So this is a fascinating topic to me and I could I could talk for an hour alone on just this topic of, of kind of the, the you know, geopolitical uh, and, and what's in the news and how does that affect students and their parents as they consider coming to study uh, in the US or in Arizona. And so I'll give one kind of personal uh, explanation and then I'll talk a little bit about what we do at ASU. But so personally, I spent about 10 years of my life living outside of the US. I lived for seven years in Japan and I lived for about two years in central Mexico and I've traveled extensively around the world. And one of the things that I've always noticed about world news is that the, the, the most uh, sensational thing will be on the front page of every newspaper and every magazine. But what an individual experiences when they are there themselves in a community, part of a university or part of a, a community is very different from what is shown in the news. And I think it's important to understand not to downplay recent events in the US, those things happened, but for a student who's actually on a, a university campus in Tempe, Arizona, the experience is different than what's on the front page of the newspaper. And I saw this myself as an American living outside the US. I'd look at the news about the place where I was living and think, really, that's going on around me because I don't, I don't see it. Um, so understanding that what you see in the news is important to, to see and to learn, but it's not everything about what's actually happening on the ground. Um, and for students who come to ASU, uh, as I said, we are a big institution, 130,000 students, but that doesn't mean that we aren't seeing and pay, paying attention to and taking care of each and every student. So, uh, you know, our advisors and student services team work closely with each and every student who's arriving to the US uh, to make sure that they feel safe and they have the resources that they need and they know, uh, they know where to go for help if they need it uh, so that they can feel comfortable and confident and safe in the educational environment. Um, and we even find that while unrest is not something that we desire, uh, free speech is an American concept that is really important to understand as an international student. We're a public university and on any given day, there could be people from the community coming to our campus to exercise their right to free speech and talk about any current event topic that they choose. And a crowd may gather around this person on campus to listen to what they're saying, and you may disagree with what they're saying. And there is a team at ASU that actually responds each time that such an event happens. One of the members of that team is my director of student services. He goes to these events and he's specifically watching for the international students in the crowd in order to come up next to them and explain to them it's okay that this person is saying these things. It's okay if you don't agree with them. That's their right to free speech. Here's what that means in the United States. So I think um, we're not only helping to make you feel safe, but we're also teaching you about why things happen the way they do in the US, why people behave the way they do um, in order to help kind of build, build the context around that. That's, that's, that's a really interesting um, insight. Uh, so 
looking at well, first of all looking at the time we're, we're starting to round towards the end of the hour um but also looking at some of the questions that have been coming through um so I, I think this idea of opportunities may be sinking into some folks because we are getting questions about particular programs or, or your programs so I, i'm going to ask another question um in that direction before i do however um rather than ending abruptly after your responses I do want to take a moment to thank you um, for, for speaking today. This has been a very fascinating conversation, and I encourage our audience to continue to ask questions. Um, afterwards, we will be in a position to respond to your questions um, and even to reach out um, to the speakers today um, to share those questions. If they would indulge some of them and provide responses, that would be great. Um, I want to remind our audience that there's a survey after this, um, so please um, provide some feedback. Also to the questions about these programs, um, both of the speakers today, both of the panelists today have provided um, some materials about the program, so you can actually peruse those and learn more. Um, um, also, um, I'll put it up in a moment, but um, follow the link to um, Edigree where you can find further webinars. This is a recurring series, so you can look at some of the past webinars around um, immigration, visa experience, um, also um, uh, description of particular programs in the US and, and how to um, begin to build out your, your profile and your, your pathway to success. Um, so I'm going to try here to bring up the screen and then so that people have that in the background. Let me see if I do this. Uh, let's see. Do you guys now see? Oh, but it's not it's on the wrong, wrong slide, though. I wanted to put the last slide. There we go. How's that? <laughs> yes. Perfect. OK. Um, so the, the question um, that I wanted to ask as a kind of final question here is um, of both of you in thinking about your programs. Um, so what I'll start I'll start with you, Robin. What makes Marshalltown um, unique or special? What what offerings do you provide that make it stand out that um that you that you feel would make international students want to consider um attending and then um moving on to next steps of success or even terminating with their experience at marshalltown and then i'll ask the same question of you susan um how does global launch stand out relative to other elp programs or esl programs so robin first all right. I've already spoken to the types of educational experiences that students can get and the handouts that I attach do give more information about the kinds of programs of studies that they might be interested in. I think that's something I haven't talked about yet that I think is unique um, and could be of interest to some of the folks on this who are interested in this webinar is the opportunity to participate in athletics in the United States um, and pursue their advanced athletic experience. Um, many students are looking for an opportunity to access playing um, sports for a United States college or university, and a community college is a fantastic entry into that. Our sports are high-level athletics. Uh, the competition level is um, amazing and intense and highly talented. Student athletes do come and play for community colleges first because what's really great is we have then the unit division one or NAIA, the various different levels of athletic um, coaches get access to seeing those students beyond just uh, videotape. Uh, sent to them or um, or that kind of thing. And so I think the opportunity to participate in something in addition to their educational experience is unique. In addition to that, music programs, art programs, other kinds of special talents that a student might have, particularly at Marshalltown Community College, we focus on the fine arts. And so students interested, especially in um, painting or drawing or sculpture, um, and may have a, have a particular talent in that area might appreciate the uniqueness of being able to come and study here get their um, two years to transfer to a university but also really focus on a special talent that they might have in either athletics or a particular skill that they have so um, community colleges are a great opportunity to really explore and enhance their own personal experiences 
So I will pass it along. Yeah, thanks. And then Susan, same question. You've spoken to the high level benefits of ELP programs, but facing a myriad of choices, why mm -hmm. would an international student in particular want to um, come to the ASU Global Launch ELP program? Absolutely. So, I mean, in addition to the fact that, that Arizona is, um, from a climate standpoint, a glorious place to live, uh, it's the middle of winter here and the temperature is 70 degrees and sunny every day and absolutely beautiful, uh, but our English language program is part of Arizona State University, which is a very innovative and exciting university to be a part of. Uh, and so whatever your interest is, there is an opportunity at ASU for you as a student, either in degree study or in clubs that you can join or activities that you can engage in. So it's an exciting opportunity to be part of this larger community. And within our English language program, we, we typically have students from 30 to 40 different countries. And so the opportunities to learn from other international students as well as domestic students makes for a really interesting and exciting opportunity for students. Thank you. And, and one, once again, so we've come to the top of the hour. Once again, thank you so much for your attendance today and to our panelists. Um, we really thank you for your, your expertise and your guidance um, and your wisdom. Um, do stay tuned um, for those in the audience um, for further news about subsequent webinars. We're trying to do these on a monthly basis and we will be reaching out with um, the upcoming topics. We also look in the survey for ideas that you may have about um, topics of interest and we'll try to work those in to our series schedule. So this concludes the webinar for today. Thank you so much for your attendance and have a good balance to your day, our evening, our morning, wherever you may be. Cheers. Bye. Bye.